good full room, this is nice. Okay, I'm going to get started because I've got a lot to talk about. Um, hopefully, yeah, this will be useful. Um, getting started as a DBA, um, that's my talk. Um, hopefully, um, inspire some people. Um, first of all, a little bit about me in case you don't know who I am. I'm James Palmer. Uh, I've been in the open edge world for over 20 years. Um, started work as a developer. Uh, moved into the DBA side of things and more recently working as an architect and also managing a team of developers. So I've got quite a wide perspective on a lot of open edge areas and um, I think that gives me a sort of fairly unique perspective in some ways of uh, how all sort of parts of the open edge world sort of marry together. Um, and we're going to start off um, talking about, uh, well, I'll give you a brief introduction as to why I want to give this talk um, and uh, do an introduction to the topic and we'll have a, the main bit, which is where the stuff is that you might want to make notes about. Um, and we'll have a little wrap up time and questions, although if there are questions throughout um, the talk, please just um, stick a hand up or shout out, that's not a problem. I don't mind taking questions at any point. Um, so why this talk? Um, DBA talks are often deep dives into specific DBA stuff. Um, and as a developer, that might be sort of overwhelming, not very accessible, particularly if it's Gus talking about how latches work or that sort of thing. Um, and it doesn't sort of get you into a position where you could maybe learn a bit about how the database works from a, from a developer's perspective. Um, and you might want to get started without having to invest in training um, or um, or maybe just create a place to play around with the database yourself. Um, most development licenses have a basic d database license attached to them, so you can do some basic stuff. Um, so essentially, that's what this talk is about, um, giving you an introduction to how you might do some database things and play around with it, get a taste for it, and then maybe see if you want to take it further with training. But first of all, a big warning. I could give you just about enough information today to do some dangerous stuff. Um, and yeah, never do anything in a production database unless it's been tested and tested and tested. Um, and also without, you know, if you don't know what you're doing, you could make things bad. So uh, make sure your CV resume is up to date as well. Just a little sort of health warning there before we carry on. So I had some choices when I was putting this talk together. Um, as often, these talks often appear on the agenda and it, um, often goes from the perspective of what to do if you get thrown in at the deep end, you know, your DBA falls off a cliff and uh, the database crashes. Um, how do you get started um, sort of working all of that out? Um, I decided to take a different approach today. Um, I wanted to give you the opportunity to create maybe a little sandbox database that you can play around with. That could be a Sports 2000 database or a copy of your own database and then do some various DBA tasks on that. Um, Learn a, learn a bit about it, have a play around uh, without breaking production or even like your test and development databases as well. They're obviously valuable as well. Um, and hopefully give you a, the appetite to do some more research, more, more training in the future. There's a few assumptions. Um, for this talk, I'm assuming you're on Windows uh, just because I was working on a Windows machine when I wrote the talk. Uh, but all of this works on Linux just as well as it does on Windows. Um, so that's not a, that shouldn't be a barrier. Um, I'm assuming you've got access to some sort of database license. As I say, a normal developer license gives you the basics. And in fact, I did all of this talk, all of the screenshots and everything else with a development license. Um, so there's nothing here which is unachievable without extra licenses. And I'm using 11.7. We're still stuck on 11.7 for, for my work um, due to barriers with uh, upgrading, which we're working on. But um, that's what I have. But uh, the, the joyous, the be beautiful thing about progress is that everything is back compatible with uh, previous versions. So if you're on 12, that's not a problem. If you're on 10, it might be a problem. Um, but that's a, that's a different topic of conversation anyway. Um, some things that I talk about may work better in 12 um, because they've added new features. Um, I'm trying to keep up to date with the features and so on, um, but there's better places to go and find out about those, those features, um, particularly from progress talks over the course of this week. Um, but yeah, just so, just as some assumptions. So let's get strapped in. And that's, that's a picture of a DBA in the wild. <laughs> uh, 
first thing to point out is the ProENV script. You may have come across it already. Um, it's a very useful script for your database work. Um, it's, all, it's a very simple script, but, all it, but essentially what it does is it adds path information to your command line, um, telling, you, telling the command line where your progress installation is. It saves you a lot of typing, saves you having to remember where your DLC directory is. And it's usually in, located in your dollar DLC, percent, percent DL, DLC, whatever, directory, uh, in the bin directory. But you can easily search for it if you don't know where it is. Just do a search in Windows for proenv.bat or on Linux, just search for proenv. Um, and you can run that script and it will set everything up for you. Um, there's an example of it. And you can see um, that's what it looks like. It tells you the version of, uh, of OpenEdge just here. Um, and it tells you that it's adding stuff to the path. Um, and in Windows, I like to type prompt at the end because otherwise you have the command prompt, which is just like that, proenv, and it doesn't tell you where you are in the folder structure. So if you just type prompt, it takes you back to the, um, that prompt at the end. Uh, you, alternatively, you can edit the proenv batch file to take the last line out, and it'll stop that from happening. As, I think it's the last line. Somewhere in the proenv batch file, it changes the prompt to... That to that, you could comment that line out and it would uh, stop you having to do that. Um, Linux, you can, you can, it does a similar sort of thing with the Pro ENV. It's a bit harder in Linux to, um, to overcome that, but you can overcome it um, if you want to. And let's get stuck in. Let's jump, let's create a database. Um, we're going to start with a copy of the Sports 2000 database. It's a very simple, small database that gets shipped with every Open Edge release. Um, but I'll show you how to do a restore of a backup later, which means that you could take a copy of your own production database or a test database and, and back, restore that onto your local machine as well if you prefer to play around with your own database. Sports 2000 is great because it's small. You can delete it, restart it, uh, recreate it, delete it, recreate it very, very quickly. Um, but yes, um, there's a command um, called procopy. So... There we go, my laser pointer. I'll try and get my laser pointer, see if my laser pointer's working. Um, it's, no, it's not really working. Um, so you've got your pro copy, and then in the percent DLC percent, that's uh, the path to the install directory, um, there's a database called Sports 2000, and I'm going to call it S2K. I always call my Sports 2000 databases S2K because it's a, lo a lot fewer characters to write later um, than Sports 2000 every time. But you can call it whatever you want. So that's essentially what you're copying, and that's what you're going to call it. And obviously, I'm in the folder that I'm working in there. Um, Ctemp DB pug. <laughs> you can put that wherever you want. Um, and it starts off, tells you what the Open Edge version is, and it takes a copy. All right, it does a few stuff, it does a few bits and bobs, and then it says, copy complete. It tells you where the database has been copied from. And there we go, we've created our very first database. And if I do a directory listing, um, you can see that there's lots and lots of files associated with that database within the folder that we've uh, just um, worked in. Uh, we'll go into what those files are, but um, most importantly, actually, other than most of its database files and so on, but the two most important files are this st file uh, and that log file, um, and we'll go into what those are. One thing about DBA work, the log file is your best friend. If anything goes wrong, chances are you'll find information about what's gone wrong in the log file. So get to know how the log file works. Um, you can see that everything is time stamped, time and date stamped here. So you've got the date, the time, the offset from UTC. Um, You've even got the PID of the process that's been working um, to, do the, to do the work. And there's some information about the user. In this case, it's called dbutil. These are the error, or the, the error numbers, information numbers based on progress. And then you've got the whole thing listed out. So you can see we've started a create se session what, and everything else. And it tells you all the information about what's just happened. So log file is really, really important. If you ever have a problem, that's the first place to look. Then we have the structure file, and that is a text file that describes where everything is located within your, within your data, or for your database. It's a mapping, essentially, of everything. So you can see at the top we've got B dot. B is the before image, so that uh, enables us to go through crash recovery and so on. It's, that's, that's where the before image is located. And this dot here, 
these dots here just mean that that file is located within the current working directory. Um, that's, so that's the, that's the path. Um, but you can see that there's the B, and then there's a load of D ones. And D means data, um, and those are the data storage areas. So that's where all your data within your database is actually stored on disk. Um, we'll deep dive into what those data areas mean. Um, so as I say, the area type is D. Then the area is given a name. In this case, we're looking at the employee area. And that's, so that's the, a, a friendly name for that area. Um, we also have a number for it. In this case, it's area number seven. All of your data areas will always start with seven, will always be seven or higher. The first six are reserved for the database. So seven and up are your own storage areas that you create. Um, so you've got the area number seven and then a comma. And then you've got this number here, 32, which is the rows per block. That's essentially, in basic terms, telling the database engine how many rows of data can go into each block of, uh, on, on disk. Um, and you've also got a cluster size of one. Um, if you see a cluster size of one in your database, then um, that means red flag straight away that those are what we call type one storage areas, which are legacy type uh, storage areas. Um, more on that shortly, but we want to have type two storage areas. Type one storage areas, the big problem is that um, um, data from various tables can get stored within the same block, which means that the database engine has to go through every block in order to find the data, which is relatively slow. Um, type two storage areas, each block only contains records from that table or that index. Um, and therefore, if we know that that block hasn't got data in it that we're interested in for this particular search, then we don't go into that block to find it. So it uh, makes things more efficient, but it also provides us with other utilities as well, which only work in type two storage areas. So the cluster size is important. If you ever see that number one, like I say, then uh, that's a red flag that something needs to be done. Then we've got the physical location. In this case, it's a dot. That just means the current working directory. Then we've got a fixed or variable. It's variable. If there's, no, if there's nothing here, that means it's variable. If there's an F, it means fixed. In version 12, there's another type as well, which means that it's limited or pre-allocated, I think. Um, um, or a variable to a fixed length, isn't it? It's variable up to a certain length, but then it, and then it will, um, that sort of thing. But it's, uh, it's a bit, we won't, do, won't go into that more complicated than we need. And then that, num that number there, so this is a fixed area, and that's the number of, that's the length of that area in database blocks. So that's, this one is 320 blocks long. Um, so this means that we've got two actual files on the disk. One of them is fixed at that size, and one of them is variable. So it will grow into that area as it's needed to. And it will go up to the, well, it will, one of two things. If you have something called large files enabled, it will go up to whatever, essentially, effectively, how much space you've got left on disk. If you haven't got large files enabled, it will go up to the two gigabyte file limit and then either move on to the next storage area or crash, depending on how you've, depend, depending on what you've got set up. Crashing is not good, obviously. Um, but there's some problems with the Sports 2000 database. Um, it's been around since, uh, presumably, around about 2000. Um, and there's some, in those days, um, there was, there was, you know, we were on version 10, um, version 9, ver version 9, version 9, yeah. Um, and uh, a, lot of the, a lot of features that we have in modern versions of Progress just didn't exist. Um, and it has, but, um, but there's also some functional problems. We don't have after imaging. I'll talk about what after imaging is in a minute. Um, type 1 storage areas, I've mentioned that. I know I'll tell you how to, sh to find this later, but there's actually an index, a, a database index within the schema area, which is really bad as well. Um, the tables and indexes are arranged, by f are arranged by function within the database, not arranged by the type of data that they actually contain or how busy that data is. So you see that they were cu customer data or employee data. Um, with modern sort of understanding of how the database works, it's better to arrange things by the data that's in them, not by the function that they do. There are indexes and tables mixed together within a storage area, which is also a big no-no these days. And we've got very small fixed extents, which is a waste of, um, just a waste of effort for, for everybody. So we're going to fix some of that, and, and we might talk about how you might go about fixing some of the other things as well. Um, but first of all, 
I suppose we should probably serve our database up so that we can connect to it. Um, and for that, we use the proserve command. So, so you use proserve, then you use the name of the database. Remember, I called mine S2K. You would call yours whatever you want to. Minus capital H is the host, local host, um, in this case. And minus S is essentially the, the service name or port number. So I've given it a port number here. So if I wanted to have a remote connection to this database, that's the port number that I would use to connect to it. Very simple serve, proserve command. Um, in your actual database, it will be a lot longer, more complicated than that. You might use a parameter file, um, that sort of thing. But this is just a thing, just a little startup script just to get us going. And um, the database puts all of that out to the screen and tell us, tells us a few things. In this particular case, you can see here this line, this server is licensed for local logins only. That's because I'm using a development license. That means I can't log in from another machine, but I can log in from this machine. That's OK. And there we go. That's the database started. Let's have a look at the log file. We can see that, error, uh, that message number 333 at the start, uh, multi-user session begin. Um, I'll mention that again later. Um, and then we get a lot of information in the log file. Uh, and it goes on and on and on. Uh, that's just a small extract. Just a quick notice on, or note on users within the database, um, or users that you use to start the database. In Linux, obviously, the user that you use has to have the right to touch the database. Um, otherwise, it won't be able to serve it. Um, and it's best practice not to use root. I mean, for your own local play around environment, you can use a root. A root user, that's not a problem, but in production, it's not a good idea to use root. You want to create a user that has uh, the rights needed to um, serve the database, but not root. Um, in Windows, the user must remain logged in. Otherwise, the database shuts down when they log out. Um, so if, you're running as your, if you log into a machine as yourself, serve up the database, and then log off, the database shuts itself down. Um, so if, you, if you're using a Windows server for your database, you want to have some sort of service account, which is the user which starts up the database. Um, and that service account remains logged in permanently. Otherwise, uh, yeah, you just have the database shut down again, which wouldn't be great. We can shut down the database as well. Um, you can see we use ProShut, the name of the database, and then this minus BY. Um, I can't remember what BY stands for. Um, Thank you. <laughs> and, uh, thanks, Roy. So yeah, so B stands for batch and Y stands for yes. So we're basically saying, sh shut down this database. Um, and yes, I'm sure I want to shut down this database. Um, and the database shuts down. And we can see in the log file, we get a, some information to tell me that the database shutdown has been started. And it's a normal shutdown. You can also get an abnormal shutdown. That's when the database crashes. And we get to the end. And we get this multi-user session end. In a real database, this could take some time. Um, you can see here, in fact, um, there's some stuff here. It's resending a shutdown request and disconnecting a dead user. In a real environment, you may have users still connected to the database, and it may take time for those sessions to be shut down properly and everything else. But eventually, at the end, you'll get to um, this, this thing at the end to say the multi-user session has ended. We can also use the ProShut command to work out this is where one of the ones we have to be very careful. You can use the proshut command to work out who is connected to the database. So if, you have, if you've got muscle memory and you, pro, and you type the minus by at the end of that, the database shuts down. So be very careful. Um, but yes, if you just use proshut in the name of the database, it excuse me, um, comes up with a list of the users that are con currently connected. Um, and you've got the user number. You've got the PID of the user. You've even got the date, date and time when they logged in. Um, you've got the user ID and then the type of connection. So I've got two connections here. One's a self-service client, which means I'm connected with, with shared memory to the database. And that's a remote connection. It's not actually a remote connection. It's still on the same machine, but I've connected with a port number, essentially. Um, and there's a couple of other bits there. And I've got this disconnect to user option here. Um, in fact, if I enter my choice number one, uh, it asks me which user I want to, to disconnect. In this case, I want to disconnect number six. It's the only user connected, but I have my user number six there, and it will disconnect that user from the database. 
um, and it disconnects them cleanly. And in Windows, that's what the client will see. Um, or if it's a batch program, obviously a message will go to the log file for the batch process. Um, but yes, you get that uh, the, the database was disconnected. A quick note on kills. I have to put this in here as well. You have to be very careful. Um, slides will be available, I'm sure, on the PUG website. So, but if you want to take a take that um, knowledge base article down at the bottom, then that's the opportunity to. Um, but if you're connecting to the database with a self-service client, so in shared memory, um, then using end process and kill minus nine are really bad because if that process has a lock, a latch, or a buffer in use, then it will crash the database. Well, the database does an emergency shutdown to preserve integrity uh, because it can't be sure that that, chat, that that process is completed properly. Um, so it will shut the database down to force you to go through crash recovery. Um, and yeah, that's, nobody wants to have that on their paycheck, really. Um, so um, the best way to get rid of users is to disconnect them from the database. And even then, a kill minus nine isn't, it can still bring the database down. So yeah, just be very careful. But there's a lot of information for Linux users, particularly in that knowledge base article at the bottom about it. Um, I can also find out what a user's doing with, with, uh, with, with progress very easily. Um, so we've seen this screen before, and we've got a PID there. So that's the process of the, pro of the user that's logged in. Um, and there's this command here, proget stack, and you give it the PID number. Um, and it will generate a stack of what the user's actually doing at that particular moment in time. So here we see, um, this is the log file, the database log file. Um, it tells me that uh, there's a, what, what the ProTrace location is helpfully, because it uh, sometimes can be hard to find these, depends on how you've started up your database. Um, but it tells you that it's generating a ProTrace file. And in fact, you can see there that um, I've got a ProTrace file with that name in the folder. Um, so obviously, the, the end here, this bit here, is the PID of the process that we just uh, did the pr command for. And if we have a look at that, this is a, just about an extract. There's a little bit at the top and the bottom, which I've snipped out. Um, but um, we can see the client startup parameters at the top. Um, we can see a stack trace um, of the code. So we can see that um, I was running read customers. Uh, ignore the dot pad. That's just a, that's a compiled on the fly file, but it's, uh, it's essentially read customers.p in this particular case. Um, and that's, that's and it's line number five, and you could use a compile listing of that com piece of code to work out exactly what line of code was being run at that particular point in time. We would have persistent procedures and classes uh, listed here if there were any. Um, we've got the pro path of the client and the database or the databases that were connected at that time. And this could be really useful for if, if you've got a, if someone asks you, this process is killing the database, what's it doing? You can just run that command and uh, find out essentially at what line of code it is. Go to the code and you might find that it's doing lots and lots of reads of uh, records or I don't know, um, all sorts of clever things, but it's a really quick and easy way. If you've got access to the server, it's a very quick and easy way of finding out what a process is doing. Okay, so we've got a database. Uh, we should probably give it a backup before we do anything else, just in case we do something wrong. Um, and we head back to our pro EMV, and we've got pro backup. Um, Online, you can also, so it works online, you can also do it offline, in which case you just leave out the online keyword, but the database is served, so we want to do it online. The name of the database and the name of your backup file. You can call that whatever the hell you want. It doesn't matter. You can put it wherever the hell you want. That's also not a problem. I like to call my, give my files a .bck extension. That's just my choice. You can call them BKP or you can be them, or call them anything you like. Um, <laughs> Progress doesn't mind because when you do the restore later, you're telling it what the name of the file is. So you can, it's arbitrary, call it whatever you want. Um, so I'm gonna give it S2K initial as my file name. And you can see it does some stuff. And at the end, you get a backup complete at the end. Obviously that was pretty quick because um, it's just a Sports 2000 database. If you're doing a uh, three, 400 gigabyte database, that's gonna take a bit longer. Um, but um, it uh, goes without saying really. And we can restore it. So I accidentally 
deleted my pug folder on my machine, so it's a good job I had the, uh, had the backup so I can restore it. Um, we talked about the structure file earlier. If you have a structure file named after your database, so in this case s2k.st within your folder, then it will use that. But if it doesn't have that structure file, it will create one for you. So, that, so you don't need to know anything about the structure of the database in order to restore it. Um, you can just hit the rest restore button and it will create everything in the current working directory. So we do the pro rest, the name of the database, and the name of the backup file. And it creates a database and goes through all the process um, of restoring that database uh, for us. And uh, we now have a copy of uh, where, we, where we started. So you could use that pro rest command if you've got a backup file from your production environment. You could obviously use that pro backup file and the ProRest command to get yourself a copy of your own database rather than the sports database, if that's uh, of, of, of interest to you. So <coughs> I told you that we'd do a little bit of, I'll show you how to find out about what, 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 or how I know that there's an index in this, in this schema area. Um, but we might want to find out other things about this database. Um, so let's go ahead and do that. Um, now, this, is, this proutil command here is probably the most common command that a database administrator uses. Um, there's a lot of utilities hidden within that script. Um, and it's always, they always work on the basis of um, proutil, the name of the database, and minus capital C. And then you're telling, then there's a descriptor of what you want, to, what you want it to do at that point in time. There's, there's a heck of a lot of them. If you look through the documentation for the database, um, a lot of stuff uses this proutil command. So it's a good one to remember. Um, and in this case, I just want to describe the database. So, uh, so we get a, a run out like this, and tells us where it's located, um, tells us when it was created, when it was opened, um, tells us when we last did a schema change, um, and tells us things about the before image, what block size it is, etc. In this case, in this database, there's after image information as well. Got information about backup dates, so we can see that the database has been backed up. And then you get this list of features at the bottom. Um, now, the thing to bear in mind with the database features, that is a list of the features that are enabled. It doesn't tell you the f features that you haven't got enabled, but it's quite easy in the documentation to go and find what features are available. Um, but this is just a list of the features that we have enabled. Um, so we can see that there's a an after image archiver been switched on. Um, and these are fairly standard things here. One of the things that isn't on here is large files. Um, so this database has a file limit of two gigabytes. In a development environment, you can't enable large files in 11. I'm not sure whether that's been changed for 12, but um, in, in a development database, you can't enable large files. Um, in an enterprise environment, then yes, you can. You can enable large files, which enables the database files to grow as big as they need to, up to a certain size limit of terabytes, which is probably, they probably get unmanageable before you, before you run out of space. Um, um, but that's, that's that. Okay, so that's how you might find out some features that are enabled on this database and maybe make a list of the ones that you would want to look at enabling. What about the startup parameters? Obviously, we've just used a very basic startup script um, but in your production environment or your test environment, you might want to see what the startup parameters that you're using. Or you may be on the communities and you're asking for help to tune your database. And Tom Bascom or someone else has said, um, can you give us a list of your startup parameters, please? Um, you can go to the database log file and you talk, can go to this 333, search for this 333 entry and go to the last one in your database log file, and that will be the startup parameters for the current um, session of the database. Um, and that, starting there, 75 to 150 lines approximately, um, you, you'll get a listing of all of the um, startup parameters that have been used. So we can see some of them down here. Encryption isn't enabled. Multi-tenancy is not enabled. Table partitioning is not enabled. The application gateway, uh, authentication gateway is not enabled, etc. And it goes on for a few hundred, couple, about 100, 100 lines or so-ish. Um, and uh, so if anybody ever wants to know what your startup parameters are, the easiest way to do that, just search for that 333, copy and paste it, and, uh, and they, can, they can do the, the grunt work of working out what they want to know. Um, but yes, that's just a, a good, good tip. There are other ways, but that's the most easy way. 
we might want to know what data is in our database and where is it stored, um, find out some information about the actual data. So we've got this uh, utility called dbanalyze. Um, and um, one thing about it, if you, just do it, if you do it without this um, pipe at the end, it just dumps all the information to the screen, which isn't very useful because it probably goes over the buffer limit of your, um, of your editor, uh, not your editor, your um, command line. Um, so you just pipe it to a file and it outputs everything to the file name. And we get this file that starts off looking like this. You can see it's a database analysis, what the database name is, um, the options that we're using. So in fact, you could, yeah, we're doing, so we're doing all, all of these options of DB analysis, but you could say you just wanted to do a table analysis or an index analysis. And we see the date. And in most environments, you'll also get this warning here to say the database is in use, so that the reporting, reported statistics are an approximation. That's just the utility covering its bum in case something's happening, whilst, well, something's in progress whilst you're running it. Uh, in most cases, it's accurate enough for what you want. And there's a heck of a lot of information in this. There's, there's all sorts of stuff. Um, but most importantly, um, for finding out about the data, data, you get a section like this for each of the um, storage areas in the database. And we can see here, this is, again, we're visiting... The storage area 7, which is called the employee, which we've already looked at very briefly in terms of its structure. And we can see all the tables that are inside that storage area. Um, we can see the number of records in that, table, in that database for each table, um, the actual physical size, um, and each rec the record size. And this can be quite useful for working out things like the rows per block and so on, much more technical deep, deep dive. But it tells you the, sort of the, the approximate size of your data within, within the, that uh, database. So you've got the minimum, the maximum, and the mean. And we've got some stuff about fragmentation and scatter. Both of those are bad because it means the database engine has to do a lot more work in order to find records. Um, with small tables, it's not going to make much difference. But with big tables, you know, if, you, if your data is scattered far and wide across the, the storage area, then it might be a problem and you might need to do some work although it's less of an issue with type 2 storage areas. So, so there we go, there's some information there. We also get information about um, index information. So this is how I know we're still in the employee storage area. I can see straight away. We've got indexes within the same storage area as data. So each table and all of its indexes are listed. And you can see information about how many fields are in the index, what, how many levels it goes to. So with really big indexes, the levels will be quite high. Usually three or four means quite a big index, usually. Um, even higher sometimes, particularly if you're talking to George Potemkin, right? <laughs> um, um, but you can see um, the percent of utilization. These are small indexes, so the percent utilization is going to be small. But um, yeah, you, you, you want, that's something you might want to keep an eye on as you get more into the database side of things. And the uh, factor as well is something else. It may be an uh, indication that some work may need to be done to compress the indexes, essentially. But uh, again, that's a talk for another day. Um, but one thing I said that I, I could tell, show you that there's an index in the schema area. So we can see here we're in the schema area there. And oh, inventory trans, there's an index. In the, uh, in, in the schema area. Obviously, there will be indexes in the schema area because the schema has indexes, but this is one of my indexes. Um, and actually, just a little bonus point, if you see default um, as the name of the index, that means the table hasn't got an index defined. So progress has to have an index on that table. So when you create a table without an index, it cr automatically creates a default index, and that index resides in the schema area. So to fix that problem, you need to create an in index for that table, and that de default index mysteriously goes away. Um, but uh, yes, yeah, so but it's a good way of checking indexes in any of having any of your data in the schema area, whether it's indexes or tables, is bad because the schema area is a t type one storage area, and you want to keep it clean and as small as possible uh, for for various reasons. Um, so, but that's how you would find out what's in the schema area very very easily. I should say about this DB Analyze, running it on a production database, it does, it is okay. You can run it in production without any problems at all. Um, it does take quite a lot of process. Um, it takes a lot, quite a while for big databases, and it can reduce the performance for clients. Um, so it's worth bearing in mind. Run it overnight if you want to run it on your production database, assuming your database is quiet overnight. Um, 
or run it on a recent copy um, in test or that's or QA QA or whatever whatever you've got in place um, just to make just to sort of avoid the process uh, the, the, the performance issues. So that's just a slight side of things. But I told you we've got some problems, so let's fix one. Uh, probably the most important problem to fix with the database is that there's no after imaging switched on. Um, without after imaging, if you lose the database, then all you've got is your last good backup. And that might have been, if you're doing daily backups, that last backup might have been 23 hours ago. You've lost 23 hours of data entry. Um, it's not much of a problem for you until the users start shouting at you because they've lost a whole day's worth of work and they've got to rekey it all and how many people keep paper records of uh, what they've keyed into the database um, during the course of the day. In our case, if that's, we've got 7,000 colleagues all entering data into the database, that's a heck of a lot of rekeying in a day. Um, so after imaging, essentially, um, it augments the backups and keeps records of all the information that has been put into the database and removed from the database and changed in the database over the course of the time since the last backup. Um, and you can use those files to create a database which is accurate right up to the point where it crashed. Um, and it, as I say there, it could be the difference between being a hero and losing your job. Um, if, uh, yeah, in a, bad, in a really bad situation. But thankfully, in version 11 and uh, later versions, it can be enabled online, so there's no excuse for not doing it. Um, so we're going to do that on our database. So we're going to create a file, and I'm calling it ai.st. Again, it's, it's arbitrary. You can call it whatever you want, um, but I call it ai.st. It's then descriptive of what we're trying to do. We're, kind of, we're wanting to put AI extents or after image extents on. And for this particular exercise, we're just going to create four variable extents in the working directory. So this A means that they're after image extents, and the dot means that they're in the current working directory. For a production database, you probably will want more than four. Um, particularly for busy databases, eight or 16 um, is not unheard of. But you don't want to go silly and get too many of them, particularly if you've got large files enabled and, um, and you're using variable extents. They will, if there's a problem, they'll just grow. They'll just grow. And um, yeah, they might be a little bit hard to manage, but at least your database isn't going to crash. Um, I would warn against using fixed extent, the fixed length extents for the after image, because if the last one, the last busy one fills up, the database either stalls because you've set that, um, set that flag on or the database crashes, one of the two. Either way, users can't use the database and uh, you've got to fix the problem and that's a problem. Whereas with variable extents, essentially you'll get to the last available one and that it will continue to grow, which isn't good, but you can keep a track of that with monitoring, um, but you have the ability to fix stuff. So yeah, um, use variable extents. In this case, we're using four of them. And another utility that you will use quite a bit as a database is this ProStruct, Pro, this Pro, Progress Structure script. And I want to add online. If you were doing this offline, you would just ignore the online bit. So you just say add. So add online, the name of the database, and the name of the file that we've just created, the AI.st. There's also a validate option. I forgot to do that step, but it's in a later slide, so I'll talk about that then. But yeah, so this will this goes ahead and it will add those uh, add those extents that we've defined, and we can see here um, it's added a one two three four, um, and then it enables them down here. So we've added our extents online. You can add any extent online as long as it's in your structure file that you've created. And we can see on the disk there's a, there's a directory listing just snipped out. We've got our files, the four files here that have been created. Now, the next thing to do straight away is to update our master structure file, so our database.st file. Um, and we just use this prostruct list command and then the name of the database. And that will refresh the um, st file. Um, that's really important because um, you want to keep that up to date. It doesn't know by itself that things have changed, so you have to tell it that things have changed. And now we can see in our updated thing, one thing that ProStruct list does do is to fully qualify all the file names rather than using the dot. Um, it fully qualifies the file names now. 
Um, so it's updated all of that, and at the bottom we can see there's now the four after image extents as well, which have been added. Um, it's good practice if you make any changes to the structure to update the listing straight away so that there's no um, ambiguity about what you've done. Just have a quick drink. But now we want to enable after imaging. And you might think this is a little bit odd, but we use the backup command to enable after imaging. And then, but then when you think about it, the backup and the after image files go together. So actually, it makes sense to use the backup command. You actually want to have a good backup of your database at the point you're enabling after imaging because that's, you're saying, I'm going to use the backup that I've just created and my after image files to be able to re-enable my database. So we're pro -backing, using the pro backup online command again, the name of the database and the name of the backup file. You can put that to null or that, um, if you want to, um, so it doesn't actually create a file. But obviously, though, any after image files that are created after that point are no use until you actually back up um, because they need a backup to go with. Um, but you could put it to null at this point and then do a good backup afterwards. Um, you might as well keep the file. It's doing the work anyway. And then we use this switch enable AI, um, which enables after imaging. We use the enable AI archiver um, the AI archiver is a daemon process which essentially, based on whatever parameters you give it, manages those files so that, it, um, so that they actually get archived off into a separate file folder. So it will, sh it will take, the busy, um, takes the busy file, marks it as full, moves it copies it across to the, another location on the disk, marks it as empty, and switches you on to the next one. Actually, it switches you on to the next one first and then does the other work. But, um, it's a, but it basically is a daemon process that uh, does all of that for you. In version 9, you had to do all of that yourself. Um, we had lots of complicated Perl scripts um, and everything else to manage all those files, and it got very messy very quickly. Um, so the After Image Archiver is a godsend. Um, um, and we give it this AI arc there command here, which is telling it where we want to have those archive files um, look at put. Um, put. Um, by the way, a note on this as well, if you're going to put it somewhere, don't put it in a network share or a UNC path or anything like that. Make sure it's a local fold folder. Um, if, the, if the network goes down, you haven't got anywhere to put them. And it, so it, it just stops, the after imaging stops. Um, and then you've got a problem as well. Um, but that's, that's just a point. Uh, and we have this AI archiver interval um, which is seconds. So in this case, I'm going to put those every five minutes, is it? Um, I'm going to set that to five minutes. So every five minutes, it's going to create a new archive file and move us on to the next extent. Um, that's a, that interval is something that your business has to decide, but it's essentially how long they can afford to go um, without, uh, and, and put up with losing data. Um, so... It's a question that you have to ask if, you know, if they can go for an hour without, without, uh, w and lose all that data, that's, that's fine. Do you set it to an hour? But they're probably going to say five or ten minutes, I would have thought, um, or maybe even less than that. There are some trade-offs with those switches that you have to sort of look at, but essentially um, that's a business decision, not a DBA decision. In this case, I've gone for five minutes because it means I don't have to wait too long to get um, screenshots for you. Um, <laughs> so that was my decision. That's my business decision. Um, and you can see the backup process goes through, and in fact, it looks exactly the same as the backup process did earlier. Um, that's because it is exactly the same. But then we get um, some extra stuff. It says the AA after image block size has been set to 8 kilobytes. It's been on enabled online. The archiver has been enabled. Um, and it said this after image management daemon will begin in a few moments. That's, uh, that's, that's one of those messages which, is, uh, which promises a lot and delivers... Uh, um, very late often because actually that the, the management daemon doesn't actually start until the backup is complete. Um, so it, a few moments could be an hour um, or it could be five minutes depending on how long your backup takes. So just something to bear in mind, I've, uh, something I learned the hard way is like you've enabled it and now, I'm, but it's not, actually, it's not actually starting, it's not actually starting, oh my backup's taking an hour to run, that would be why. So when the backup's finished then it eventually does enable it. Um, so there, we get, uh, get that. And we can also see um, in the log file all the information as well. So everything's dropped to the log file. So if anybody asks you the question, when did you enable that after imaging? You can tell them exactly when it was. Um, so lots of text here. Um, but right at the end, and this is the important thing, so you can see the full backup is successfully completed there. And here we go, the after image manager is beginning. So 
that's what that's the evidence of what I've just said. Um, but that's the that's something. This one three one nine four message is something you want to look for in your log files if your um, if your after image files are not being swapped over if they're just filling up um, and not being marked as empty. Um, then you want to have a look at this message to check that that's actually been put into the log file because if it hasn't, then the daemon process isn't running, um, and that could well be why things aren't being done. Um, and then if I look in my after image archive file uh, folder, this is, you can see, um, every five minutes, 25 past, half past, we're getting an archive file um, with a funky name. Um, <laughs> there, there, there is, there's, a, there's, there's a reason for this. Um, what the, the, this, is the, this is the date when, and essentially this is the date and time when um, um, after imaging was enabled on that particular database. And this is the sequence number since that, um, since that happened, um, which ironically is the same as that. We've been asking Progress for years to make that name, these files more meaningful because sometimes it can be really difficult to work out which is the next backup file to, or next after image file to apply um, when you're rolling forward. Um, but that's a problem for future DBA. Uh, we won't worry about that today. Uh, oops, sorry, I'll just go back. I wanted to show the log file as well. Um, you can see here, there's information here about the uh, switching happening. So there's swi it's been, we've switched to AI Extent 4, um, and then you see the after image extent is being copied to the, to the location, and the after image file has been marked as empty. And you can see every five minutes that sort of loops around. And um, so this is number this is number four, and then when it gets when when four has been finished, so it goes one, two, three, four. Four is finished, and now we go back up. To, it switches back around to one, so it's just sequencing through those extents um, for you, um, and that, that will just continue until you, yeah, until your disk is full. So that's the other thing; it's up to you to manage that as well. So one thing that Progress doesn't have is um, is a daemon which tidies up the files after a certain amount of time. Obviously, every time you do a full backup, you don't need to. You don't need the previous um, after image archive files because they're no longer useful. Although I would say it's probably a good idea to keep two or three backups worth of backups and after image files just in case the last backup wasn't good. Um, so you've got something to fall back on. But you certainly don't need to keep them longer than a month, say, or a week or whatever, depending on your situation. So you need to write a process which will get rid of these archive files um, over time. Um, Yep, you should create them locally um, on the server and then copied off the server and copied off the server as quickly as possible. Um, if, you, um, if you lose your server, um, then obviously you want to have something to fall back on. Um, so you want to get those files off the server as quickly as possible. Um, and that's, they should always be kept with the database backups. So you get them all off the server as soon as possible. And you also want to regularly get them off site. If you get a meteor strike or whatever, then uh, you're going to want to fail over to a disaster recovery site or whatever. If you've then got no, no backups and no after image files, then you're also a bit stuck as well. So um, just a sort of public service announcement there. Where are we up to? 10 minutes. Uh, I whizzed through some of this. <laughs> Always takes a lot longer in reality, doesn't it? <laughs> um, um, I talked about how we've got um, type type one storage areas across the database, so we could add some type two storage areas. Um, I talked about the um, so I'm, I'm adding these two storage areas: one called tables, one called indexes. One's for tables, one's for indexes. Um, giving them a number, um, and we can see I've changed the rows per block. Um, these are for these are for small. Small records within the database, so I only need 100. I want to get pack as many of those records as possible into each block. Um, but you can see here, most, most importantly, after the semicolon, we've got a cluster size of eight and a cluster size of 64. Immediately, I know that those are type two storage areas. They're not type one storage areas. Um, and I'm going to use the prostruct add online command that we've seen before to add those. And I said that I have this you have this validate option here um, and um, 
basically what validate does is to check that the structure file is valid and that there's enough space on disk to create those extents. Um, so it, it's a non-destructive way of checking that, you're, um, that, you're, that you've created a file which is valid. Um, it's, all, it's always good practice to do a minus validate before you do a, a, an add-on line of a, for the structure, just to make sure that everything's OK. Um, but you can see here there's enough sufficient free space. Uh, so you can see the format is valid, and that there's enough free space to, in it, to put those extents in place. So then you would actually run it um, without the validate, and um, we get our extents added, and we do our prostruct list to get the structure file back up to date again. And we can see there's a lot of information here about those storage areas, um, but you can see most importantly we've got cluster size of, what, of eight and cluster size of 64. Um, <coughs> so then we could use the table move command to move some of our tables to these new, this new storage area. So the customer table, for example. Um, so we're using Proutil, the name of the database, and then the command table move. And we're telling it to move the customer table, and we're moving it to the area called tables. And we're also, optionally, you can also say, I want to move the indexes to, another, to a different storage area. If I kept that off there, then all the tables and indexes would go to the same storage area. Um, but I can put the indexes thing on there, that's the name of the storage area for the indexes. Um, it tries to find an ex get an exclusive lock, and that locks the whole table. So no updates are available on that table for anybody during this process. So the whole table gets locked, um, and a lock has been obtained, and it moves the customer table to the tables area. And um, it tells me that it's been done, and the indexes have been moved to the indexes area there. It works very well. Um, but as I say, relatively simple. You can script it. You could write. You can with a with a piece of P code. You can write a script essentially to inquire of the database where all my tables are. You can create and you could create a batch file which would do all those table moves for you and just set it running. In fact, I did it recently on our production database because uh, we had an error in our structure file from a, a, a long from a consultant who shall remain name, nameless um, and. Um, um, so we had a load of data in a type 1 storage area, so we created a new type 2 storage area and table moved everything across. Um, it took a good chunk of the night, um, but it got it done nice and easily without any down downtime. Um, but it's slow. It locks the whole table so no updates can happen on that table. And you have to do some tidying up afterwards as well to remove the old storage areas potentially. Um, and your structure always looks a bit shonky. I like to have my, st I like to have, I'm a little bit OCD, so I like to have all my areas with nice, you know, sequence, num with nice numbers, you know, starting at seven and everything else, whereas uh, this all makes a mess and, uh, and all of that sort of thing. Um, there is an alternative, which is much, much quicker, um, and uh, that's, that's using a dump and load, um, but that's way beyond the scope of this. Um, but you could you dump, essentially dumping all the data um, in a binary format out of the database and loading it into a new database with the correct structure. Um, it's, a, it's good fun. It's a, it honestly is a really good fun process. And um, if you ever get the chance to be involved in it, then, then please do it. So it's, it's, one of, it's a very pleasing uh, process, very cathartic sort of process, being able to just you know, write all the scripts to dump all the data and load them all back in again and have a nice, clean, friendly-looking database at the end. Um, so yeah, it's good fun. Uh, but not for, not for today, particularly not with five minutes left. <laughs> so yeah, we've talked about creating a database backup restores, looking at the details of the database and uh, adding some after imaging extents and, and enabling after imaging. Maybe understood a couple of common problems that you might come across, particularly with Sports 2000, sort of things you might look at. Um, but more importantly, there's a bunch of resources. Um, Pro Progress Community is a great place. There's a lot of people um, there who have got far more experience and knowledge than I have who are more than willing to share that information with people, even Progress Tech, uh, support guys are regularly looking in there. People like Roy and so on are in there and looking at uh, uh, looking at questions and so on and answering them. So you know, it's the best way. If you don't want to create a support request, you don't think it's quite worthy of a support request. It's a good way of getting support without sort of asking formally, as it were. Um, you've also got the Progress Education Community. Um, if you're serious, get formal training. It's uh, there's no there's no substitute for it, and the, there's some great training out there. 
both online training, but also the um, there's boot camps and things like that that you can do with Progress. Um, I did the um, the DBA boot camp many years ago, and it's uh, improved a lot since then. But it's a really good week of uh, of, of sort of really in depth training on how to do all of this stuff. There's uh, just a couple of other ones. Um, Progress talk um, is uh, is always is always, it's a little bit dead, but there are there are people there who will answer stuff. Um, but it's you know it's just an alternative that um, that is good, just a good place to look. Sometimes I know I sometimes there's sometimes questions I want to ask which maybe don't necessarily want progress to know that I'm asking those questions. <laughs> Sorry, Roy. <laughs> um, um, but. Um, uh, yeah, um, mainly because, mainly you know, if I'm asking this question, I might get a phone call from the product manager saying, oh, we can sell you a product for that. And it's like, well, I don't, yeah, I'm not, I don't want a sales talk. I want some help with my, with my problem. Um, and then you've got the Pug uh, YouTube channel with past talks and all the talks from this week will be on there as well at some point, I'm sure. Um, so it's a good place to have a little bit of a dig and so on. Um, but yeah, with that said, we've got two or three minutes for any questions that people might have. Yeah, we've just we've just wrapped up. So uh, just questions time. Yeah. Any questions? Or anybody awake? That's uh, yeah. Yeah. One after lunch if you would. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good question. Yeah. So the question is, um, if there's an on, if you do an online backup and there's an inactive index um, in the in the backup, do you still have to activate it when you restore? And uh, yes, I believe you do. Um, um, so none of that. It doesn't. Uh, the backup restore doesn't do anything in terms of activating anything. Um, no, that's like yeah. Ah, that I don't know. Um, so, the, so, so it's not registered as an active index after you've activated it. I don't know that one. That's um, that's probably that might be one for the community. <laughs> um, but yeah, I can. Um, if you ask, go either some of the progress guys or go and speak to White Star Software. They'll be able to tell you, answer that one for you. That's a good question. Um, the point is, though, the backup is the way the database is now. So if yeah. it's registered, it's not registered in the backup. Yeah, I, that's a good. Yeah, so Roy's saying if it's not if it's not registered now, the backup is a copy of what's now. So if it's not back, if it's not active now, then it won't be active after the restore. Um, so we will, we will do that. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're, it's probably the, the answer is probably not. Um, it's probably going to be exactly the same, but I can't say definitively. Um, I've not tested it. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you, everybody, for coming, and uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. I think it, I think it might be lunchtime, is it? Yeah, yeah. great. Thank you.